So this is the talk from Dr. Dilraj Grewal, who is at uh, Duke uh, University in uh, the US. So he couldn't make it. So he just, so just sent me, so this is how is the talk goes. He'll just talk a little bit about the basics in the be beginning. So like all those maneuvers we showed in the last talk, if they don't work, so this is like the Brahmastra. So this is like what we can, in our armamentarium, this is the next level. So this was initially described as long ago as the 1980s by Dr. By Dr. Robert McEmer, who is like the father of vitreous surgery. And it's very important that this should be sufficient. The cuts, so this is when you cut the retina to make it free and mobilize it. So it, the cut should be large and sufficient. When you're going about it, be generous about it. How to perform? So you can have a circumferential or a radial shortening. So both these can be tackled, but what is most important is you need to extend the retinectomy into the normal retina also, about 30 degrees of normal. So don't be satisfied with just tackling the area of concern. If you do that, it might fail. You have to go into normal retina also to relax it sufficiently to get a good reattachment. So these are also areas, basically, again, anterior contraction, which are not relieved. So, so this is going uh, this is familiar thing that the anterior PVR is a bugbear, which is very difficult to tackle. So you have to extend it into the unaffected area to be able to settle the retina. If there's a focal retinal incarceration first, I would recommend that we release it. You always do less invasive things first. And then if it still doesn't settle, you might need a localized retinectomy. If you have fold edges, of a GRT, these are also area where you can uh, excise it and release it. And it's important to uh, avoid slippage by always keeping the uh, flute needle at the edge of the brake, so keep on drying it when you're doing this maneuver. So I think there's a patient who is a 44-year-old fake female with macula of RD, very, very poor vision. So this is the surgical video which he shared with us. So I think the lensectomy is done. He's removing the capsule now. And you can see it's a very, very bad case. I mean, there's this extensive PVR. There's a huge tear. And he's, uh, this is a bimanual surgery with the spatula and the forceps. The spatula, we don't use so much here. Maybe in the US, they're using this. Oh, I don't know. We, we are not using this so much. But he's. Now the cauterizing the edges, so it's good to cauterize this so that the bleeders don't happen from the retinal vessels. And area which is anterior, it's important to excise it completely because if you leave it, it goes and attaches to ciliary body and then there's always some hypotony in these eyes. So this is the 360 retinotomy and then I think in the previous operation, some PFO is there, so this is the subretinal PFO which is being removed. So, and he's trying to look for anything underneath, which is any PFO left. And so it's important to, if you're going something so aggressive, you have to go all the way. And now see, it's very interesting. It's, he's going on putting PFO and he's going on sliding off. So what does this mean? Why is this PFCL not staying? Anybody any, has any ideas? Why, where is the, yeah, so basically if, you, if, if your epiretinal is clear, you have to go. So there could be like a napkin ring or some uh, membranes which are behind the retina, which are holding this thing like a tight ring. So once those are removed, so you have to look above the retina, you have to go and look below the retina. So, so, so only once everything is removed, in fact it has settled, it doesn't look so great. Post-op day also it's like a tiny sliver, but Fortunately, patient did well at one year. I got 20 by 400 vision. So this is the this is the optos picture at one year. The role of adding a scleral buckle is also quite important. So basically, this supports the horns of the edge. So 360, of course, we don't uh, put a scleral buckle in 360. But if there's a limited retinectomy, it's always a good idea. If there's a fake patient, we are very uh, have a low threshold for adding a buckle. It reverses the direction of the vector force perpendicular eyeball increases the curvature of, radi uh, 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 of radiation, and this gives a good kind of support for the retina. The vector forces get adjusted, and it helps to settle the retina, and the horns of the retinotomy should be on the crest, not the trough of the buckle. 
some people are advocating primary retinectomy for, PV, uh, for PVR, but I will not, uh, I mean, this is just for information. I, I, I don't say that this should be done. So even after retinectomy, and you can still have a referent retinal detachment. So that is one of the most disheartening situations. You've really done everything you feel. You've used the ultimate weapon, and then you have it. So you need to know why it could happen. There could be fibrosis of the retinectomy edge, inadequate, so it should be adequate. Like we said, you go into the normal retina. Don't try to be stingy with it. There could be an ERM, which can need another surgery to remove. The anterior PVR, have, we've gone on and on in the first talk and the second talk, that you need to tackle that. And um, severe folding and recurrent PVR is something beyond your control. So thank you so much for your patient listening. And we can just have a small discussion on both the talks. Yeah, yeah. So you can come on the mic there, sir. Mic, mic. Yeah, sorry. What is? Huh? Okay, I'll just put that on. Uh, Audiovisual, can we just go back to the slides, please? This one, sir? Hmm. Next. One second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe a little posterior, but main thing it should be, but it is giving, basically the posterior part should get coverage. So in this case, it is getting, I think, yeah, maybe a little bit posterior, but otherwise it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. That's, true. Uh, that's why it's very important that it covers it adequately. So that's the, of course, in a vitrectomy, we don't uh, localize, but otherwise that's why in scleral buckling, we are very particular about localizing the break. Because it can leak from the anterior part, it can look from posterior part. So, yes. So actually, if you have put a scleral buckle, there may not be any need to do retinectomy because your scleral buckle is anyway going to indent the sclera and uh, you know ca 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 cause the retina to get ad adherent to the retina. But if you, if at all you are planning to do a retinectomy, then very posterior ret retinectomy also will not work because it will slip on the buccal uh, slope. Yes. And if the if the edge goes under the buccal slope, then you will not be able to even laser the slope, this thing. So it would be good to do it on the buccal, the, the, the maximum height of the buccal. Yeah, and sometimes if we do a 360 RR, we actually remove the belt buckle at the end of the surgery. Uh, so uh, similar to what Madam was saying that, you know, n in today's time when you can manage a very decent uh, vitrectomy, even, uh, even in the anterior vitreous, and if you are planning a RR, there are very, very, very few indications where you would actually want to put a buckle to support the RR edge or a retinectomy edge. Very, very uh, uncommon that you would want to do that. Uh, because usually then the way you are saying uh, it, your, and if you want to be able to laser the edge of the RR, your buckle would have to be fairly posterior. That itself it, uh, is not something which is very physiologic or easy to do. Maybe we have to put it a little oblique, quite oblique I should say. Just don't put it. Huh? Just don't put it, you probably, you know, in most of the cases, you probably have to extend the RR edge a little more on either side and you're no able no. to uh, manage without putting a buckle where you've already planned an RR. Yeah. So then you, it's, it's redundant actually for this. Any other comments or tips or tricks, Dr. Abhishek, Dr. Ratra? So if I can uh, give a few tips is, uh, very often uh, when you start doing a vitrectomy, a retina which looks uh, very contracted, if you do a good membrane uh, dissection and membrane removal, the retina can give, become quite mobile. And you will be surprised to see that you may not need to do any retinotomy or retinectomy in such a retina at all. So first, uh, most important is to do a good membrane removal. So even when you are planning to do a retinectomy, it is always good to remove all the membranes uh, on the retina. If you do not do that, your retinectomy is going to fail because it will contract again. And moreover, you will not be able to flatten the retina. So you see the LPFC will uh, you know, it roll over the retina retinotomy yes. edge and will go subretinal. Sometimes when you have done the retinotomy prematurely before removing the membrane, the retina will just close like an umbrella and there is no way you can open the retina after that. So never do the mistake of doing premature uh, retinectomy. Mm -hmm. Always do membrane peeling first, remove all the membranes, make the retina as much mobile as possible, 
then take a call about where to do retinotomy and how much retinotomy to do. And second thing is always remove the membranes posteriorly first and then anteriorly. So if you remove the anterior membranes first and the anterior retina becomes mobile, then it is difficult for you to reach posteriorly and do the posterior dissection. So it is good to do the posterior dissection first and then come anteriorly. And once the posterior retina becomes a little bit mobile, you can put a bubble of LPFC to keep it little stable. Mm -hmm. So it will also help you in uh, uh, doing the rest of the dissection anteriorly. How often do uh, panelists do ILM peeling in these cases? Is it necessary to remove ILM in these patients? All the time, sometimes, or never? And uh, second question is, along with this, how do you, what technique do you use for staining? Because I think there are a lot of innovations. You put, some people are putting PFCL bubble and using a brush needle to put the dye under that. So role of ILM peeling. Yeah. ILM peeling, I would say that I don't believe in doing ILM peeling in all the cases. ILM peeling you can reserve for, uh, say, very refractory patients with a large macular hole, or if you have a very high myopic patient, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, foveosiasis or taut uh, retina at the posterior pole, those patients you can uh, do ILM peeling. Because ILM peeling in a retinal detachment is quite difficult. Uh, despite your, you know, years of experience, you may still have to struggle. And uh, staining and everything is very difficult. So you can stain under LPFC, and you can even do the ILM peeling under LPFC. But it, it is difficult as compared to a normal ILM peeling that you would do. So you have to take a call based on, you know, your expertise and whether it is really necessary or no. Dr. Abhishek, anything on that? Yeah, so Why one of the things is that uh, along with the epiretinal membrane peeling in PVR, it's also quite important to do a uh, subretinal peeling. Sometimes you just, uh, what is visible to you is just a band and the folds are not really settling. If you do a 180 or 200 degree RR fold over the retina, you may have sheets of uh, subretinal tissue and the minute you remove that, the retina opens up very, very well. So that is something that you need to be aware of. If you've done epiretinal membrane uh, clearing and still there are folds, still the retina looks uh, contracted, this is something that I uh, try and has been, uh, has worked for me. I almost never do staining after putting the PFCL. Even if I want to use PFCL for peeling, I'd always stain first and then because doing the brushing thing, first of all, you're inducing trauma, and it will never be as uniform as it is. Almost always before starting the peeling at the posterior pole, I put in dye. Whether I want to peel ILM or not is a different question. It highlights, uh, it, uh, due to this negative staining, yes. it highlights the ERM, makes me well aware of from where I want to start or what area would be an easier, uh, I would say, choice to initiate the peeling. So I yeah. almost 100% of the time stain. And one thing about ERM peeling in PVR cases, don't stain, I mean, staining once is not usually enough. Sometimes in the same case, we stain four or five times. Ah, so don't feel shy times. to stain it again. I mean, don't feel shy to stain again. You yeah, know, don't some feel shy feel to stain to again. Peel. Sometimes you need to stain multiple times uh, because it, these cases take time. And by the way, brilliant blue, sometimes the color fades with the, uh, sometimes. So you can again stain. Sometimes you've removed a membrane thinking that it is ILM or sometimes thin ERM, yeah. to stain again, you'll see that there is another membrane uh, underneath it. So stain multiple times when you have uh, bad PVR, there's nothing that you are going to lose. I think it basically you ensure that hyaloid comes out with this. Yeah, I, even I I, ILM, sometimes the ma'am says it's not really required, but you just take out a strip of ILM. There's no publication on this as such. But then you are sure that you've got the posterior hyaloid because these are not like cases which have been operated three, four times and they've come to us. So we want to make sure they settle at that time. Is we don't want to fail, so that's why we go all out and do some of these things. I think one point that I would like to add is that you know in PVR in in retinal detachment, I think even with the best of hands, going behind the hyaloid is very important because in most cases you will find the hyaloid attached. So yes. even if you know the whole history, or if you are even the primary surgeon, you feel that you've done everything. I think uh, stuck hyaloid is always one of the major causes to see. And I think, uh, as uh, Dr. Darius just mentioned, I think highlighting with that ILM uh, peel, I mean, blue dye it does kind of help to ascertain that you've kind of tackled the hyaloid properly. Yeah, one final point about retinectomy. Do clear the peripheral vitreous very well before doing retinectomy. The most common cause of failure that I have seen after an RR is a strand or a band of vitreous attached to the RR membrane, which later on contracts and lifts off the retina. Dr. Abhishek, just come here. There's a question, but just put your laptop in. Dr. Abhishek, a laptop connect. So we can take a question now, please. Uh, 
sir, this is related to your, your presentation. Okay. So if there's a case of re recurrent retinal detachment with silicon oil in C2, yeah. how do you really deal with it? Do you remove the silicon oil and then deal with the uh, recurrent RD or do you do? Yeah, so like I showed in that uh, algorithm, basically if you have a recurrent RD and there's a focal membranes, or supposing you have a little bit of inferior fluid, then there are two options. One is you can do it under oil, a limit, a limited retinopathy, or you do membrane peeling under oil. So that's a very localized area which is affected. Or if there's a little uh, fl a fluid in a small, tiny pocket, you can just do a little bit of laser and you can leave it alone also. It's not necessary to go after it. But if it's extensive, then you must go the full way, take out the oil, and then uh, do a re uh, revitrectomy. So then you don't attach the infusion line at all? Just make two ports and just yes, peel them? Yes, yes. If you're doing an MP under oil, then what you can do is you just have two ports with the valve cannulas. You, if you are more comfortable 23, that's also fine, 23, 25. Then you keep that oil ready so that eye does not become soft and you try to use a relatively new uh, cannula, maybe, I mean, one time or something because uh, we, we all are reusing maybe. But uh, you keep putting the oil, make, keep, keep forming the eye and then you, with one hand you have the light, one hand you have the faucet, then you keep on peeling and when the eye feels little soft, you can re-inject the oil with, through that port. Thank you. There is also an option of having silicon oil infusion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so sure. we use the silicon oil infusion itself. So you have the infusion cannula, which is connected to a syringe with silicon oil. So Normal. that as the silicon oil, you know, uh, seeps out of the eye and the eye becomes hypodermous, you can inject a little bit inject oil. Or the sister can inject. You have the sister sir, can. I have one question, sir. Uh, once doing membrane peeling under oil, after removing the membranes, how do you drain that subretinal fluid? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically in that condition, uh, uh, you have to have the oil infusion. So you inject the oil, make the eye tight, and then you take the flute needle near the break. So you have silicon oil fluid exchange. So when the eye becomes a little tight, there'll be pressure. And then once you take the flute near the break, there has to be a break there. If there's no uh, pre, I mean, there will be obviously a break, but if the break is very anterior, you can even make a uh, posterior R1. These are conditions, uh, make a retinotomy posteriorly and put the flute needle there, then fill oil. And then with the pressure, the retina will go back and the fluid will come out of the retinotomy. Sometimes, it's sometimes it's there is no break and it's more like a TRD configuration. Yes. There you don't need to drain. Yes, sir. Just remove the membrane, it's fine. If, if if membrane is slightly anterior and uh, fluid is slightly posterior, it has gone to the posterior folds because of the lying down position of the patient. Uh, in that case, uh, can we put PFCL bubble also, or how can we? Drain? No. no then if you, you want to do all that, then you if you want to do all those maneuvers, then you remove the oil and do it like a proper case. You can then make you can't a, do it under oil. Then you, you can make a like retinotomy a under oil also. With the oil infusion, you can make yeah. a posterior retinotomy and that drain. That you can it. do, but uh, but don't try to put don't PFCL try to put in an oil field. Ah, because. Just do not try to do that. Then you get a Thank sticky you. oil and oil, and it just it can mix. And then, then to remove that is a um, nightmare. We have, I think we all gone through that, so don't do that. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> sir, can we do this yes, silicon sir. oil re RD? Under yes, yes. With air, with air I think you have also try to take it out. No, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. You can't. Don't don't mix the. Don't mix these things together. Sorry. Please, please ask one more question. I wanted to ask silicon oil, uh, like re RD under silicon oil, can we manage these cases with air infusion? Like uh, the ma'am mentioned silicon oil infusion. Similarly, if we use air in the infusion, can these be uh, done? No, the problem no, will be at the end, then you will have a hypofill. Okay. No, and also there are two things, underfill and also the visualization will become terrible. You have air bubbles and you want to see clearly. So you won't be able to, sorry. Yeah, interfaces, yeah, there'll be too many interfaces, yeah, yes, thank I you. I read and uh, somewhere heard, so I was confused uh, whether to try this or not. No, we no, don't I recommend it. I think with it. oil infusion, uh, it's don't very, very it. supportive and the globe also because kind of Because the forms. oil will become underfill and then you get too many interfaces. Sir, and I, I had seen some videos, international videos, where they use a very low infusion uh, pressure. Sorry, fluid. I, I didn't understand. They attach the infusion line and use a very low uh, pressure, very low bottle height. For what? Do with that. In what situation? In the same situation, sir. I've seen a few videos. But if you put infusion fluid with saline, then there'll be underfill it's after that. Yeah. There'll be underfill, so I don't that think that's right. a good. Sometimes these videos, you have to be very careful to see exactly the message. So the fluid and air or whatever that you want to use to replace the lost oil, 
will work only when it is a TRD configuration. It's a very small procedure. You just have to peel one membrane and end of story. But if you have to drain or it's a slightly more extensive thing, oil will be lost, so you need to replace it with oil. Yeah. Also, since the membranes, membrane peeling requires a very high degree of stereopsis and clarity, having two, three media, it will actually, will be holding the retina and pinching it at many times and the bleed will start and uh, yes, it will be yes, messed up. Yes, yes, it's correct. That bleeding is a big problem once it bleeds. Yeah. I have seen two cases uh, of uh, recurrent detachment having PFO in situ for yes. uh, a week or five days. So is it advisable or any added advantages are there or? I do it as a routine. You can yeah, leave Dr. PFO. Dr. Abhishek is very fond of this. Uh, I, I do it as a routine. You can leave PFO for uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, nothing happens. There's no problem. The biggest advantage is the patient does not have to position and if it's an inferior break, PFO does very well. You can leave PFO. For how long uh, we can leave PFO? The longest I have left is six weeks. But I think recommendation, I think we should, as a, at a forum we should say around two weeks should be, two to three weeks. So Dr. Steve usually, Charles is also so describing this So usually what happens is that, you know, whenever you do laser, your CRA will form in two, two weeks time. After that, any time you want, you can remove it. After removing PFO, we need to inject oil or... Uh, no, no, I just leave it with air, a routine FAE. But if you're not sure of the retinal status, I would recommend you put, uh, if you put uh, replace the PFO with oil, PFO with oil, and then do the SOR after two to three months, if it's a very bad case. Especially if you're the beginning, I think Abhishek is a master surgeon, but for all of the rest of us, I think you should maybe replace it with oil. That's better, because you put air and then you have a recurrence, then you can be in a really bad situation. And uh, another uh, question I would ask is, uh, are there any disadvantage or adverse outcome of uh, peeling ILM at the primary surgery? If we see some sort of PR A or B in peripheral area or uh, so, it's a... Uh, there, was, there was a time when I was doing it for every RD case, then I realized it's really not worth it. It doesn't add anything much to your practice. If you see significant number of ILM striae or some epiretinal membrane, fine. I still stain every case, and if I see that there is a membrane, then I will remove it, but now I've stopped doing it as a routine. The downside is, while doing peeling in a detached retina, sometimes you may cause a retinal break and then unnecessarily mess up things. So, you know, do the minimum possible that is required to get the uh, objective of a flat retina. Yeah, sometimes less is more. 